I will start by reading what you already know, but it is fundamental to make clear that that's what we're doing. In this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. And you have given us the role of board of directors. Okay. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin, which we have. You will have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 20 minutes. During the Q&A, both you and the judges stay in character. After the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside the role playing. Some important things to keep in mind, the ethical aspect of your analysis, they're the most important part. However, they should be described in simple, practical, common sense fashion using technical philosophical terminology or basing your arguments on religion or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. Similarly, any member of the team reading his or her part will be considered a major mistake, although you may use notes. During this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking roles. And it would be great if one of you just told us uh, well, that uh, your topic is the ethical considerations of insulin affordability and availability. And you are at the State University of New York, Potsdam. Yes. We will put 25 minutes. Um, does anyone have a iPhone that you can know yourself that, that this is where things are happening? We didn't bring phones over. Okay, then I will be responsible for this and I'm hitting start now. Good afternoon, board directors of Eli Lilly and Company. We are the Ethical Insulin, Insulin Solutions Consulting Group, and today we'll be dissecting the legal, financial, and ethical considerations regarding the affordability and availability of insulin. Now let's meet the team. I'm Jacob, our strategy consultant. I'm Morgan, I'm our HR consultant. I'm Colby, I'm the financial consultant. I'm Jordan, I'm the management consultant. And I'm Garrett, and I'm the operations consultant. So to begin, we're going to go through a little throughout the presentation. We're going to start with proposing our solutions to the, the problem. We're going to then lead into our legal dimension, follow our financial dimension, then our ethical dimension, and we're going to conclude with a conclusion. A little bit of background. Before we begin, I want to inform you all a little bit of background. Um, diabetes is one of the fastest growing current diseases uh, in the globally. 38 million U.S. adults suffer from diabetes with five to 10% of them being type one diabetics. Type one diabetes disrupts the body's ability to produce food into energy due to inadequate insulin production. Insulin administration is crucial for these patients on a daily basis, but yet high prices pose as opposition to them when being able to afford it. There are three big corporations, including yourself, that control about 90% of the US market. In 2002 to 2013, the U.S. accounted for 15% of the insulin produced in the world, but yet accounted for 50% of the revenue. This poses questions as to what are the insulin industry's priorities. Originally, the three founders of insulin and the, the production patent in 1923 sold the initial patent to the University of Toronto for $1 a piece. This was based on their idea that insulin should be available to the world and that there should be no limitations or restrictions uh, for anyone to access it. Now I'm gonna pass it on to the solutions that Morgan's gonna to present to us. Thank you, Garrett. Like Garrett said, I'm going to be talking to you about solutions today. As the board of directors, you came to us and asked us for advising on what the best approach would be to solving the problem of insulin affordability and accessibility to the best of your ability. So looking at what the current solutions are, we wanted to start there before offering our proposal. 
First, Eli Lilly has enacted the Medicare Part D savings model. This is in alignment with the 2022 passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which caps insulin costs at $35 a month for Medicare beneficiaries. As a company, you've also adopted this. Those who are under Medicare, the federal health insurance, Part D covers prescriptions, of which insulin is one of them. This ensures that anyone covered by this plan has access to $35 insulin price caps. In addition, Eli Lilly has name brand insulins and in 2019 introduced the non-branded counterparts of their insulins. This cut costs by 50% for consumers and in the past five years, costs have been reduced by an additional 40%. So we're really working towards that affordability aspect. The third thing that you all have done is the Lilly Insulin Value Program. This capitalizes on $35 insulin price cap and expands the access beyond Medicare beneficiaries to commercially insured patients, as well as uninsured patients. All of these are steps in the right direction, but we do want to avoid the public perception of profit prioritization at the expense of human lives. It would not be advisable as a company for that to be the public perception. With that said, we wanted to take a look at your mission statement and make sure that we're offering solutions that align with what your company's values are. Looking at the mission statement, there's a couple of things that we wanted to emphasize in offering our solutions. And those three things would be the increased access to medicines, the ethical and responsible operations, as well as improved lives and communities specifically for type one diabetics in the United States. Looking at that mission statement and expanding on what's already being done, we have a three-step solution that we would like to propose. The first step is going to be big three partnerships. As you can see in the graphic, we have the big three companies, yourselves, Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk, and Sanofi, which make up 90% of the insulin manufacturing market in the United States. With that kind of market control and the high barriers to entry into insulin manufacturing, we believe that it would be advisable for the three companies to come together. In 2017, a lawsuit was launched against these three companies, accusing them of increasing insulin prices in lockstep. This goes against what we would want public perception to be for your company. We don't want people to think that you're jacking insulin prices with profit as a motive. Insulin is a life-saving miracle medication for people. As Garrett said before, um, diabetes, or perhaps you didn't say this before, but before insulin was introduced into the market, diabetes was considered a fatal diagnosis. If you had it, it was essentially a death sentence. So when we say that insulin's a miracle, we really mean it. And we want to make sure that the public and everyone who requires insulin to survive knows this as well. Partnering the three companies together to avoid future lawsuits would work in your advantage. The second step of our proposal is intermediary restrictions. There's much to be done on the manufacturing level, which is part of what we're proposing. And a lot of high costs for consumers come with intermediary negotiations, such as insurance companies, and pharmacy benefit managers. We want to make sure that as a company, we're taking all of the steps that we can at Eli Lilly to reduce those negotiation powers from intermediaries that results in higher prices for consumers by putting policies in place that restrict that negotiating power. And with that partnership of all three companies, we think that this will work in your advantage as well. The third step of our proposed solution works directly off of those restrictions and the big three partnerships as well. And that would be pricing standardization. Pricing standardization is, an active, is active for certain insured patients, such as the Medicare Part D beneficiaries that Eli Lilly value. Um, program that's enacted um, in 2020. Um, pricing standardization, if we could get insulin costs to be the same across the board, all three companies could work together, avoiding those future lawsuits, accusing them of jacking prices. And it would work to everyone's advantage, both the consumer and the manufacturers, to stay in business, stay making a profit, but without that undesirable perception of the public that profit is what's motivating the companies. With the solution in mind, I'll pass it off to Jordan, who'll give you an overview and an explanation of our legal dimension. So I'm going to be covering uh, the legal dimensions. I want to uh, cover some of the laws and acts that we've implemented to push for um, more affordable insulin, as well as um, expressing like where we are right now and the moves that we can make.
So first, I want to be talking. We'll be talking about the 1941 Insulin Amendment. Um, second, we have the 1997 Food and Drug Administration Modernization Act, um, and then our 2009 Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, as well as our 2020 Alex Smith Insulation Affordability Act. So 1941 um, Insulin Amendment. This was the first time that we saw the government um, step in and the FDA step in um, and have these manufacturers send a um, a dosage of their insulin to Toronto for analysis regarding the potency and the purity of the product. Um, before this, there was really no regulation as far as um, testing and analysis on the insulin that um, their consumers were receiving. Um, and then the 1997 FDA Modernization Act, this is the end to the Insulin Certification Act that essentially um, curb the amount of insulin that was able to be uh, produced into the market. And once again, this is focusing on the quality and their standardization um, and raising the regulations of insulin and the quality of insulin. Um, this brought about new technology such as the insulin pump. Uh, this allows, um, instead of going to a doctor, this allows uh, patients to be able to just um, give themselves insulin. And then in 2009, we had the Biologic Act. Um, this is the first time that they considered insulin um, a biologic rather than a drug. A biologic is made up of living, uh, living <laughs> organisms um, instead of um, synthetically made um, pills or drugs. And then this, so moving into a biologic, um, this shows how the competitive market is because it's harder to um, replicate a biologic rather than replicate another drug. So it's hard for companies to be able to um, create a generic version of insulin because it is a biologic and the process of making is much more difficult. Lastly, in 2020, we have the Alex Smith Act. Um, this happened in Minnesota. Alex Smith was 26 years old. He was um, too old to be on his family's insurance. Um, so he was living on his own. Um, he was a type one diabetic and he was forced to ration his insulin because he wasn't able to afford insulin. And this actually ended up um, causing him to pass away. And um, now this act is actually made federal before it was just at Minnesota. And now it's actually a federal act and it's the uh, Affordable Insulin, uh, insulin Now Act. Now I'm going to be passing this on to Obi to discuss the financial dimensions. Thank you very much. So I'll be talking about the financial dimension of our presentation. So as a quick overview, first I'm going to be talking about the insulin price history and how, just to give you an idea of how prices of insulin has changed throughout a couple of decades and what it is now. Um, then I'll be talking about some of the financial struggles people have had to over, overcome because of the prices of insulin. After that, I'll talk about COVID-19's impact and how it was really brought, brought insulin prices to light of how much people are struggling because of them. And then finally, I'll be comparing the U.S. average price of insulin to other countries just to give you a big like, view of how much difference it is compared to us and them. So from this graph, we have the price of insulin from 1991 to 2018 per unit. And as you can see, there are a bunch of different types of insulins across the market from long acting to rapid acting. And they, this is just per unit of how it much it is. And as you can see, it's on, it was on a steady increase throughout the years besides immediate acting, which took a small dip. But as you can see, there was no signs of it really slowing down or dropping anytime soon. And when, while it doesn't seem like a lot per unit, when you put it together, as a Medicaid Part D patient, I they to have, on average, 62 units a day for insulin, which can account to about $20 a day. And for a year, in 2018, that could cost the six grand a year for one patient under Medicaid D. And there could be multiple people, so that could be up to 12000 18000 just for insulin prices alone. And that's with insurance. So people without insurance are paying much more than 
Um, so financial struggles. People are still paying out of pocket, even with medical insurance. Some people are paying up to $5,000 just to meet a deductible to qualify for whether it's their insurance or their spouse's insurance. And even with the deductible paid and the insurance, they still could have to pay out of pocket to get insulin. And that doesn't seem right in the long run. Uh, people are rationing insulin. People have decided that in order to pay their bills for the month, they might need to use less insulin and hope they make it through the day. Whether it's that's half, a quarter, or maybe just skipping a usage altogether and hoping it's for the best that you can make it through the month and to afford more insulin and rent or your kids, kids' school bills. And that shouldn't have to be an option for a parent or anyone in that situation. Um, healthy food or healthy you. When you are diagnosed with diabetes, a healthy diet becomes even more important because you are at higher risk of contracting some other type of disease or illness. So people have to decide whether they want to buy healthier foods, but not be able to afford insulin for the month because healthy food isn't cheap either. That's a whole other problem. Or they have to get insulin and just hope that their diet is good enough with what they can afford to not get some other kind of disease from their diabetes. COVID-19's impact. COVID-19 really hit the world hard financially and really brought to light just how much insulin is a key factor to people's financial struggles. There is lots of negative implications because of the high cost. There were many surveys done across the state and the world about people with financial struggles during COVID, and about 70% of them listed uh, diabetes care as a key factor to why they are financially struggling. And a lot of those participants in those surveys said they make about $70,000 to $100,000 a year annually. And that's just not just one seller, that's either both or just as a total. So you can make six figures in America and still financially struggle just because of a disease that you didn't choose to get in any way, shape, or form. Um, and comparing the U.S. to other countries, the U.S. average price for insulin is $99. And as you can see, some countries, it's as low as $3. So, which doesn't make much sense when U.S. is claimed to be this financial superpower and amazing, and we are paying about 33 times more than other countries that the U.S. or other that has deemed not as powerful or well off. So why, are, why is a country that's supposed to be so amazing and rich making people pay up to like $100 for a disease that they didn't choose to have just to survive? And now I'll be passing over to Jacob for the ethical dimension. Thank you, Colby. I'll be talking about the ethical dimension. To start with, I'm going to give a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. Firstly, I'm going to be talking about insulin access as an ethical issue. Then I'll be talking about historical background, healthcare versus wealth care, and the right to insulin. These, these insulin manufacturers should not be profiting or should not be considering profit as their main consideration when selling their product. Because the three companies make up 90% of the market, they have the power to control the price and basically set the standard of how low or high they want the price to be. From our research, we found that the insulin manufacturers claimed that it was the pharmacies for making for jacking up the prices and making it unaffordable, claiming that the pharmacies were the main reason for higher insulin prices. But whether who is to blame, there's still accountability need to be taken in considering accessibility and afford affordability for their customers. For some background, when insulin was sold to the University of Toronto for $1, they sold it under the premise that insulin should belong to the world. That is not represented through current prices today. And now nearly 60% of insulin users lack secure access to affordable insulin. Back then, before insulin was discovered, diabetes was considered a fatal diagnosis and this life-saving medicine is needed for most patients to go about their everyday life. Because insulin is biologic, there is less room for duplication in the market. And this leaves the monopolized market far more harder to breach when considering accessibility for insulin. 
healthcare versus wealthcare. Americans, on average, are paying extremely high, higher prices than any other countries. It is found that Americans specifically will pay a far higher price than these other countries, typically for the same exact kind of insulin. This, this can lead to other risks and potential health concerns. An example of this is a study done by the Yale School of Medicine. They found that one in four um, patients led to rationing their insulin, leading to a severe negative impact on their quality of life. And it is the company's responsibility to not let their diabetic patients suffer because of the financial strain of high costs on it. We believe as a group, insulin is a human right. The access to insulin is a human right. Humalog sold to wholesalers is sold for approximately $275 now compared to $21 when it was first sold. This price range is only specific to Humalog, but as we can see from the graphs, high prices represent through all the different types of insulin. The public's view of the overall healthcare industry is seen that they, the healthcare industry has been overall neglectful towards the population. And this is not the kind of reputation these companies would want to have considering that this is a life-saving medicine that they need. The average cost in the US for insulin from the graph was $99 and the second highest was way lower than that averaging to about $75 difference. And there's no, we, we find that there is no justification for this huge price difference. And this is why we consider our solutions. We, we would like you guys to consider our solutions. And, and now we're we'll passing it back to Garrett for the conclusion. Thank you, Jacob. As we can see, insulin is a multifaceted issue that requires a lot of careful consideration when trying to implement change. We, we believe that by aligning our solutions along with the ideas of the original patent holders, we can make a brighter and better future for insulin and the entire market in the United States. We hope Eli Lilly will work with us in the future to make this possible. We would like to thank you for your time and considerations today. We now can open up for questions. Do I have questions for you? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So what we'll do is start. Um, it looks like you'd like to start. I want to start. Both of them yes. I'm type 2 diabetic, which okay. means I do not take insulin. Mm -hmm. I get to take some of the, the drugs, yeah. in which there is a radical difference in the prices. But I'm listening to you as a member of the board. Okay, now I'm just as a diabetic. And you've just basically told us as board members that we're unethical because the price of insulin is so high. You've so grievously insulted us for all the effort that we put into um, Eli Lilly and our commitment to medical advances um, and drug research and development that why should we take you seriously? This question. I think it's less about the board itself. It's not meant to be us coming to you and saying, these are unethical actions. You're not taking steps in the right direction because you are. And the healthcare industry is very complex. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of different factors involved. Mm -hmm. um, as a member of our consulting group, I have family members who are type one diabetics um, and the financial implications on their lives are really devastating to watch, to see someone who never chose that life have to struggle to like achieve some degree of normalcy, so to speak, is really devastating to watch. So I think it's more about public perception of what the board's role is. A lot of something else you this though, because we're a for-profit company. We're on the on the stock exchange. Shouldn't profit be a major consideration for us? And if so, should would you advocate literally giving insulin away for three bucks 
right, per unit, because we've just been able to synthesize a competitor to a Zembic and Wagovi that has just been approved by the FDA. So can we use that, the ability to profit from the drug that can be used for obesity, but obviously to help type two diabetics, should we use that as the lever to be able to then lower the price for the type ones? Because do you know what percentage of the population is type one as believe, opposed to type two? I believe the percentage of the population within diabetes is five to 10% for right. type one diabetics. Right. Mm -hmm. So would you advocate that we lower the prices on, on the insulin and make insulin our loss leader, if you will? I think that Eli Lilly has been in the market for a really long time. Eli Lilly was one of the first insulin manufacturing companies on the scene in the United States. Um, to this day, insulin only costs 2 to $4 to manufacture per vial. And if those vials are being sold for $35, that profit margin is still widely exponential compared to the manufacturing costs. So I think lowering those prices for the consumer isn't going to completely diminish the profit margin for the company. There might be a little bit less, but with new innovations and new drugs for other types of not diabetic related medications, I suppose, I think that there's a lot of room for growth in those areas where, to my understanding, Ozempic is like an additive to your life. It's not something that you need to be alive the next day. Liz, can we come back to you? Uh, yeah, one more question. Come back oh, to you. And I will more. <laughs> um, Allison? Allison, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're muted. Oh. oh, there you are. We can't hear you. You're muted. Okay, can Thanks. you hear me now? Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I, I enjoyed your analysis, but I also have serious questions about your analysis. You know, the insulin itself is a tiny part of the overall cost of taking care of diabetes. Uh, most patients have pumps, they have needles, they have glucose strips, they have monitors. Those are the biggest expense. The insulin itself is a tiny percentage of the cost. So what are you going to do about all the other paraphernalia, I will call it, um, that is used to actually get the insulin in the right amounts into someone's body for them to use it? Um, because we, in Lily, we don't make the, the needles, we don't make the syringes, we don't make the glucose monitors. Um, so please help me understand more because I actually would like to suggest that Eli Lilly makes zero profit on the insulin itself. The cost is so low and the cost of manufacturing includes the cost of the vial, the cap, the sterilization, all the different testing that goes on. So I'm curious as to the bigger picture of where this fits with all the other things that diabetics have to deal with. Um, so I believe our main proposal was the big three partnerships. So Santa Fe, um, Eli Lilly, as well as Novo Nordis. So with the big three partnership, this would allow all three companies to um, essentially move in the right direction together. And maybe this could uh, lead to more innovative products and as well as um, creating the technology such as the pumps and the vials and needles that are used for, um, that are needed for the consumers. Um, I also agree that I believe that there should be zero profit made from um, the sale of insulin and maybe even just push for the sale of the products that, need it, uh, that are needed to um, take the insulin. Um, I believe if all three companies work together, they would be able to um, diminish the cost of these products and maybe the competition would lie um, with the companies producing the um, products that are needed to take insulin rather than the price of insulin. So I, I have to push back a little on your partnerships. I mean, it's against the law, I blank out of what the name of the law is, for companies to collude on pricing. I mean, that's against the law. Um, so you're advising that we break another law? 
I'm also curious if we provide, it does cost us money to make it. If we are to give it away free, we've got to increase the price of some other drug to cover that. I mean, in the end, as my fellow board member said, we're a business, we've got to make ends meet. We have got to make a profit on our business as a whole so that we can continue to invest in developing new products and new drugs like COVID vaccines and like the life needed drugs for obesity. So I, I'm curious as to your answers to those sorts of questions. I mean, ethically, I don't see how we can because we're breaking We could be indicted for a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Yes. For collusion yes. with the other, the other two manufacturers. Right. That was going to be my second question. Seriously, how are you going to? Yeah, I, I, we're going to do the perp walk here. No, I, I, I wouldn't suggest that you guys are breaking the law. Does that obviously be on in itself? I'm telling you, you're breaking the yeah. law. That's a violation of the antitrust laws for the three major companies, as Allison said, to its price fixing, essentially. We all agree to lower the prices in tandem with one another. We are in violation of federal antitrust laws as well as state antitrust laws. That is horrific. So how are we going to get around that? If Would you then suggest that we just act independently? Should we take the moral imperative? and not engage in discussions with Santa Fe and, and uh, Nova Nordis. This comes back to our second step of the proposal, those intermediary restrictions. Federal health insurance does like fix prices, so to speak. When they say you can't sell insulin for more than $35, that price cap, I would argue that that is part of that. It's not coming together to agree on like, we're gonna sell for this price, we're gonna do it this way. Like we're all gonna to come together and like conspire to sell insulin for a certain cost. It's more just, this is the cost we agree on, but we can't go over then selling according. And that's regulation by the government, not collusion among the big three. And there's a legal difference. Do you see the difference? Yeah, I guess the only way that it would be able to move forward is if they actually merged as the companies, which would be difficult. And, and, and that would be also against the, the government would not let us do that because then there'd be no competition. That's, that's the Clayton Act, the monopolization. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm also curious, I mean, you know, the, the insulin that most people take it's not plain insulin. It's it's all it's a it's a molecule. It's a protein. But almost all diabetics take long acting insulin, and the technologies to make it long acting were developed by us and by you know Novo Nordisk and by the other companies. That cost a huge amount of money. The investment we made in developing long acting insulin so that diabetics don't have to inject themselves as often. So it's not plain insulin anymore that, that is used. And we need to get a return on that investment as well, because we want to improve the treatment even more and invest further and come up with even better ways of treating diabetes. So um, I, I am a little concerned about also comparing this with, with European prices. In Europe, healthcare is covered by the government. I mean, it's controlled by the government. We don't have that here. Um, so would you suggest that we go to government control of something like this? Or what are your thoughts? Um, I guess I can take a stab at that. Um, the, the idea of showing the other prices of the European countries wasn't to like initiate the idea of like government controlling the prices. It was showing more of that it is possible to have these lower prices and still have thriving companies that make them because it just because the government controls them doesn't mean they can't still have a profit with those prices. There's always, they're doing something right where they're able to still make a profit and help advance technology and medicine, but still keep it affordable for everyone, no matter how much they make. And that was the main idea. I, I actually think the government just swallows the loss. The governments pay a much higher price. Those prices you have are the price the patient pays. That's not the price that was paid to the manufacturer. It's the price the patient paid. 
Um, and, and isn't it, I'm curious what your thoughts are, because here it depends on what sort of insurance you have as to what it costs. So do these diabetic patients have the right insurance program behind them? I'm not quite sure. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I am concerned with your sort of, I understand the principles of what you're trying to achieve, but I don't feel like it's something that will get us to the place where you want to be. We, we will not break the law. At Eli Lilly, we're very ethical. We do all that we can. We give away free drug to people who can't afford their medications or who don't have the right insurance. We give away so much free product to people it, with all diseases. So, I mean, um, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's not, in my mind, as much insulin as how the healthcare system in America is run. Thank and you, Alice. I just want to see what Stephen thinks. <laughs> to change it slightly. Uh, thank you, fellow board members. <laughs> uh, I have questions, I hope I'll change it, go in a little different direction. Your talk mentioned how perception is a major issue within, uh, I guess, the our nation's uh, viewpoint and everything. So if it's a perception issue, and we already as a company do a lot of things to try to increase access and make things affordable and help people, couldn't we just address this with better advertising and marketing around efforts we do do? I think that would be a step in the right direction as well. A lot of public perception comes from the misunderstanding of insurance involvement or a lack of clarity on the way that the system functions, less so manufacturing costs and everything like that. Um, earlier in the presentation, talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, that caps the cost of insulin for Medicare beneficiaries at $35, but the act itself is primarily about climate change. So not many people have the understanding that that's what's going on. So part of the public perception being, we think you're doing this for profit, which is something we want to avoid, better advertising and better promotion of that free giving away of insulin, um, the price caps, the programs, making that information more readily available would definitely help. I have a question that I am concerned about how you would answer. So what makes this issue that you are discussing an ethical issue? What's the part of it that you feel, obviously there's dimensions that my board members have, have, have mentioned, but when you think about what is in fact the ethical issue here that you feel is the most critical to discuss? I think there are two parts of this question. So coming into the presentation, um, we're looking at the issue as insulin and access is a human right. Insulin is something that people need to survive. So making sure that insulin is available is of the utmost importance. I think now given the concerns brought up by the board members, it becomes less about the manufacturer's role and more about the role of intermediaries and insurance companies, less about, to speak like broadly, not the question of like, what can you do as a company, but more about what are different things that can be done in terms of advertising and marketing, making sure that the publicity is really positive so people understand what's going on and also are aware of what's happening. And also making sure that with all the different insurances that are involved, people have an understanding of the best way to approach insulin affordability that works for them. And a lot of that comes from pharmacy benefit managers, less the company itself. So I think perhaps a different approach to the topic, talking more about insurance would have been a more successful way to lead into it. Well, we have only a few minutes left of the discussion, six minutes. So what fellow board members are the most important ideas that each of you might wanna share in the six minutes that we have? 
he had a slide up, and I think it's the penultimate one. Insulin is a human right, right? With the ribbon. That's it. Mm -hmm. I think that if you had come in here and pitched a marketing program that insulin is a human right, okay, and that we want to invest a lot of money into that and show that we are maybe going to take a loss. Um, and I say that parenthetically because I think, as Allison said, we've devoted probably a billion dollars to research for the other biologics, you know, the long acting, the, the more innovative versions, that that would have been incredibly powerful. I thought that slide said it all to me. And oh, and there's even the finger prick, the blood. I just realized that's brilliant. Um, the, the, or as you say, had you pitched the notion that the pharmacy benefit managers are the ones who are laughing all the way to the bank with regard to insulin, um, uh, more than the drug company itself. Um, I always feel badly as a lawyer when, and I know you don't have a law school at Potsdam, you know, when you, when you go into something like, you know, let's get the companies together for this big kumbaya moment because you, did, you, you had no basis for knowing about the Sherman Act and that creating one company violates the Clayton Act and we're all going to jail big time. <laughs> the Justice Department marathon is coming for us all. I mean, that's always a frustration when you have the undergraduate schools that aren't associated with, um, with the School of Law. Um, the passion is definitely there. Mm -hmm. The presentation skills are, you know, are so there. we're still playing our role. Oh, we are. You <laughs> 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 Honestly, do you have anything for us? We have like three minutes. Can I ask a question? I, I love this slide. It's a really good one, but isn't access to healthcare a human right? I think that's the bigger notion. I think part of like what you're saying about how we don't have that like connection to law to know about those things. I didn't know about things. It was very scary when you brought them up. Um, <laughs> that was why I was like, oh, they're going to jail. This is so bad for us. Um, but I think that's the broader approach that I think all of us took when creating this, which is why it presents really idealistic healthcare comparative to what, um, I don't remember who brought it up, but someone talking about comparison to Europe, I think it might have been yeah. um, Alice no. talking about how there's government regulations on Medicare access. I think that's the broader perspective we're coming to this with, that problem solved, so to speak, when this would just be like one subset to making that happen. So, yes. <laughs> Shortly. Well, before we give individual feedback, I just want to make sure that Stephen and Allison have had a chance to say what they need to say. We're still in our role. Yes, we are. <laughs> we have two minutes and a half, so I want you both to be able to. Thank you. With the access to healthcare as a whole, how would we then decide what? other products need to be at zero profit. I mean, if the logic is, you're saying access to insulin, similar to access to healthcare, healthcare as a whole, that because insulin is such a human right, we shouldn't be making profit on that. I mean, we are a business that has to make some profit to be able to fund the additional research, just working, everything. So how ethically will we decide which products we can sell with some profit margin and which ones we need to say, hey, this is, Zero profit now. Yeah, I think like as you dive into the numbers of things within the, the United States, there are 38 million U.S. adults that are impacted by diabetes, with only five to ten percent being type one diabetics that require the daily insulin dosage. Dosage. So with that small number of five to ten percent, you still have 90 percent of the diabetic population that you. I don't want to say profit on because that sounds bad, but you can make your money back in that way. With and then insulin being such a low percentage of that product. Yes. So, with other products, we would just be looking at a percentage of population. Like, I how think, would we apply this across? I think there would definitely need to be a lot more, I don't know any examples offhand, but there would definitely need to be a lot more investigation and analysis on like the data. I believe, though, it would be a, a good start to look at the numbers to see where 
we can afford to take those losses or to look at the profit margins within other drugs. And, you know, if we have to take 5% from one, but we're still making say 20% instead of 25, it's still a step in the right direction that we can implement throughout the board. So I think, yes, looking at the numbers would probably be the best approach at that. Mm -hmm. Are you done? Yeah, I don't want to take her time. Well, I'd like to fit in both of you before we. Allison, do you have anything further to say? Not, not in further. The in the okay. Ruth, anything in this role? In this <laughs> role? <laughs> Six minutes. I mean, we're close to ending. You know, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, Is there anything? Just we're going to move into the other part. Yeah. If we don't. Looking here. Um, I guess. All right, time is up. We want to spend time as ourselves, helping you be as effective as you can be um, in this. I'm sure this took weeks and weeks and weeks and tremendous research and a full heart that was driving how you want change to be better. All of that's wonderful. And I guess my approach is going to be, we have only two more chances. There's what you do in the 10 minute tomorrow and what you do in the um, 90 second. And it's very possible that Allison and, and um, others will have suggestions for how you can improve the you know, what you're doing, but I want to focus on how you can actually improve the two things that are going to be happening to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how, based on the terrific feedback I think you got from several mm -hmm. board members, what is it that you feel you might want to focus on when you do the 10 minutes? How would you do it differently based on some of the challenges and questions that have been raised? I think we definitely need to readdress the big three partnerships because as you guys said, the breaking the law is definitely not advisable. <laughs> 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 so, so I think we need to go back to the drawing board tonight and make some revamp with Judge Thomas <laughs> because we do not want to come into this. I do like some marketing idea that yeah. you proposed. Um, you did one thing that was very interesting to me. You had three A's right off the bat, accessibility, availability, affordability, and then later there was um, a fourth one, accountability, mm -hmm. which is of course the ethical dimension. Yep. And if you have 10 minutes, mm -hmm. that's not a bad framework if you're gonna think about yeah. reorienting <laughs> um, a, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately you don't get to put the slide up tomorrow because yes. this is so powerful. Oh, yeah. it, it really is. It's, it's um, you know, it's remarkable. Um, and I'll talk to you afterwards because I know there's another team after this. Yeah. And I'll tell you about Ozembic and all the other okay. things and how they fit together uh, into the picture. Um, but honestly, I would focus on the four A's um, to, to pull it together. Because tomorrow is only the ethical dimension. You don't have to worry about the law stuff tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> No, yeah. okay. Yeah. Honestly, you don't want to say something that's illegal that some judges will realize is illegal. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to deal with the financial ramifications tomorrow. It's only the ethics, mm -hmm. and I think your ethical argument of act, you know of accessibility and why the company should be accountable, yeah. notwithstanding its desire to make a profit, is a pretty pretty powerful one. Okay, let's also see what Allison yeah. has to. So I, I hear what you're saying, but you know, the price, what, whatever the cost and the price of insulin is, that's not what controls what some, an individual or a family has to pay. It is, what is the insurance program that, that they have? Um, and I really do think insulin, you've picked a great example, but it's emblematic of the whole challenge of healthcare as a right, because that's what other countries take much more. It's a right to provide it. And if you, if a, an individual or family can't afford it, the government pays for it. Um, and we don't have that here. 
And you end up with this variability um, and it doesn't come from the manufacturing cost. By the way, no drug is ever priced based on its manufacturing cost, never. It's the value delivered. Because think about it, it the value is immeasurable. And that's the challenge that we have in healthcare um, because very few of the drugs that are on the market, 99% the, of drugs on the market, there is no profit margin. There never was, there never will be, but they're kept on the market because there's profits on the big few. And the typical pharmaceutical company has five or six big drugs that they make the profit on in those first few years and that funds the research. So understanding the mechanics. Uh, I'll tell you the other sort of a thing that I, I'm on the board of Boston Children's Hospital and people complain about the list price. It's so high of what you see on your insurance company slip. It said they, it cost X and they negotiated it down. And in the end, and you're out of pocket is, you know, something at the bottom. That list price is paid by foreign patients who come to this country. 15% at Boston Children's Hospital, the patients come from out of the country and they pay list price. Because they pay list price, children's hospital can afford to cover and pay for the 45% of their patients who are Medicaid, who pay 60 cents on the dollar. So that's the whole business. You have an, a, a very high price for the um, people who can afford it, namely foreign and very, very rich people. And you have a price that the Medicare can cover for those who have no insurance. That's the Those are the population that have basically no insurance. So it, it's a very messed up system and it's it doesn't work the way regular markets work. That's one of the messages that I hope you get from this discussion that we're having. This isn't a business based on what it costs to make it and therefore what it costs to sell it. It's so mixed up is a word that I would use, but it's think about it. I do believe that healthcare is a right for all human beings. We have to work out how we can do that in this country. Can I respond to that quickly? Just like looking for additional feedback, would it be advisable for the 10 minute, which Garrett and Jordan will do tomorrow, to open with that framework of believing that healthcare should be a human right and that this market is a little bit mixed up and then focus specifically on like this shift to marketing and advertising or would that be too broad of an approach? I think that would work as long as it's advertising and market education as to what's behind it all. Because what come, came out to me in this presentation is you don't understand how this market works. And if you don't understand, you've got to understand and the public has to understand how healthcare actually works in terms of all of the research, discovery, development, getting FDA approval, getting on the market, marketing and selling. It's it's a very complex business, but it isn't quite like any other business. You know, when you buy a car, yes, it, there's a there's a you know there's a price for the car to be made, and and you can price it based on a a, a a profit margin on top of that. You can't do that in healthcare. You just can't do it. So I I mean I hope you've learned a lot from this discussion because it's people like you that can continue the whole process of teaching others why healthcare is, is to me, healthcare and education are the two most important things that any parent can give to their child. That's what we owe everybody. Thank you for your help. It's really, Steve, do you have anything to add? Sure. Uh, one, good job. This is a difficult topic. Thank you. I did want to recognize you did lots of really good things from just the order you passed it, telling us what you're going to do, repeating it, and giving us, uh, helping us guide through. Good, good things to see. Uh, one thing I would, as a tip, and I'd like to see hear what you guys think, because this is my first year doing this, so <laughs> I don't think this would be useful, but I haven't done the, uh, and I have not seen the uh, presentations, the other ones, so I don't exactly know. I thought it was real good where you brought up the company's mission. And I would lead into that some more. Because that, yeah. from what I, I believe, that's going to register with some of the eight board of directors. I think that it's probably, probably, probably why they are on that board. 
and they care about that. So tying that, especially if you're tying it to your uh, shift towards sort of marketing messaging mm -hmm. and connecting that, I would think would be pretty powerful. I think it's really important because ethics is everything in the 10 minutes that when you talk about marketing and when you talk about um, the framing of it, it really does have to be about what your personal take is on how ethics is going to make a, a connection with a system that is not functional so that your ability in the 10 minutes has some space to deal with that. My question is in the 90 seconds, how do you think you're going to handle that? And what kind of feedback do you want from any of us? I'll be doing the 90 second one. Um, I know it says the suggested framework is to be an employee of the company or like role play it from the opposite end of the perspective and talk about that. Um, the approach I have going into it as of now, feedback be very helpful. Um, talking about the historical perspectives. Um, I think Allison said it best. You can't measure how valuable something like insulin is. Um, so when thinking about making it affordable and accessible, like how do you stay profitable as a company while also not asking people to put a price on their life and like it's something like this sounds like a nightmare to cover in 90 seconds <laughs> it's very convoluted he's speaking from the heart and you'll figure out a couple of really predominant reasons why people why your colleagues need to understand <clears throat> and support i mean you're not going to be solving the problem but it sounds a lot in the 90 second, like you are driving awareness in a way that opens doors. So you don't need to worry about covering everything, but you need to cover the things that you think are the most critical because you've all worked really hard. Yeah. And you took on the world. Yes. <laughs> Somehow when you take on the world, it never works out exactly the way you hope. But I think the the energy and the caring and the, the the just the wonderful vibes you give. I love that you were constantly uh, nodding your heads when somebody else was talking, and it didn't feel reinforced or it just felt that you're really into this. It mattered. It wasn't just a project. Um, especially for you if you do have family members. Yeah. So bring bring tomorrow, bring bring yourselves tomorrow and what you're doing in the wisdom that certainly you know you've heard from um, some of the board members. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Your insight was really valuable. Much appreciated. We I actually have a couple of minutes. We do. So, yeah, we do. Amazing. I have I have a quick comment. I, I hope all of you go into the healthcare industry when you, uh, you know, get really launched on your careers because the background you've got is great. We, as an industry, we need people like you to question, to challenge, to change things, and to get change at every level, right up to and including at the government level, um, in terms of healthcare. I would go after the primary, the pharmacy benefits managers in your 90 seconds, to be honest with you, because, yeah. because they're profiting from the markups like crazy. The drug company really probably, when you think about the cost of manufacturing, the marketing costs, um, why do you think they're marketing Ozempic so much on television? And Jordy, it's my favorite drug. Right, that woman, the heavy set woman, is on television every night doing the Jardians stands. <laughs> the Jardians is is still patented, right? It's still in that initial phase, and metformin, which is the baseline drug, is long off and costs almost nothing. Yeah, you know. So you know, but the rationing thing is is 
very, very disturbing because a lot of people can't, they just can't afford the drug or they don't have insurance and they don't fall into the safety net programs. So somebody who earns like that 26 year old, if he wasn't Medicaid eligible, right? And, but he's not earning enough. That's why you're seeing him rationing yeah. um, the drug. And in insulin, diabetic, uh, insulin dependent diabetes, diabetic doesn't produce any increase. Their pancreas is like a yeah. zero. Yeah. Whereas a type two diabetic, you know, can cheat a little bit more depending on the progression of type two because they're still manufacturing the substance. But um, you know, it's 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 a fascinating disease, by the way. Not that I wish it on anybody. Um, and you know, I think what you're going to see going forward is for the type twos, which is ninety percent of the diabetics. You're going to see the development of all these other drugs. And the reason that I mentioned the Ozempic mm-hmm. is because type two diabetes has a tremendous correlation to being obese, mm-hmm. and that has a correlation to cardiac disease as well. Yeah. So the, the, one of the pushes for Ozempic, besides the fact that the companies were making a fortune, is mm-hmm. the fact that if the Ozempic keeps someone thin and reduces their risk of the type turning into a type 1 yeah. or of heart disease and, mm-hmm. and hypertension, that's possibly the wave of the future. Yeah. I have one more thing, but I want to make sure, Stephen, that you have a chance to uh, you go first. No. Pause it. So you can go Well, first, any other questions that you guys have in preparation for tomorrow that we haven't addressed? Um, so as far as do you, so would you recommend, so for the 10 minute, it's mainly going to be the ethical issues. Um, the way that I'm kind of thinking about um, attacking that is focusing on um, the rationing of insulin and like, um, bringing like Alex Smith into it. And then obviously, as um, we were talking about before, using as a human right. But how would you suggest that I wrap that the ethical part into it? Because if I'm talking to the company itself and I bring up like, this is basically the causes of your prices, how would I wrap that to them? If that makes sense. Is it about, I mean, is it really about that? Well, I, I kind of want to change the focus on like the human rights and like the marketing of um, what these, what Eli Lilly would be doing, like what they actually do do that is goes unrecognized. I think. I think it just works well as like an emotional connection. Like right. this is why this matters so much. Like, people are losing their lives mm-hmm. undeservedly. If you go back to the mission value side, don't have Eli Lilly's mission and values <laughs> memorized. But I mean, that's supposed to be like the, hopefully, I'm gonna go with cornerstone or like the base value as a mission of how Eli Lilly There it is. There we go. <laughs> so being able to tie into improving lives, like how do we improving lives with what's going on right now? Right. Yeah. And I, that was the first one that picked up. We can go also, what's our ethic? You can, probably lean on what's our ethical and operate ethically and responsibly. What's our responsibility here? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so so yeah. I think tying it back to that. So right. okay. Allison, yeah. before we close, do you have anything that you would say differently regarding what they could accomplish in 10 minutes versus? In, in 10 minutes, I think you want to start with the mission. Start with the mission. Because the mission and pick the pieces. I'm getting some feedback. Sorry. Yes. Um, you know the two the, the pieces: increase access, improve lives, operate ethically. Those are the three that are important from your perspective. And go back, go back to the create. Because if we don't, if we don't succeed financially as a company, we can't make more medicines to make life better. As we need to close, is there anything that any of you need to ask us? Not so much, but 
that we have covered a lot, but is there anything else that will make you more comfortable as it relates to tomorrow? I think you guys did a pretty good job at kind of just throwing suggestions out there and how we should attack it. So yeah, and I definitely appreciate the harshness of like the question. Oh, sure. <laughs> no, it's not bad, but it's it's I wish we had someone that had reviewed it, like even maybe our professor that might have been like that is gleaning, but uh, <laughs> you know I'm I'm really yeah. yeah. Alex Smith is sort of your contemporary. Yeah, he was only what four or five years older than you are, and yeah. his life was cut short. You were proxies as, you know, when you speak in the 92nd, yeah. right? As an employee, as a young employee who has the opportunities, who wants to improve lives and communities, um, you know, who wants to be an ethical individual personally and in the workplace, you're standing in his stead because he can't speak anymore. Excuse me, but there are people. It's 3.30. Yes. I want to thank everyone. I appreciate you, the terrific, um, uh, wonderful coaching that Allison and, and um, I'm so tired. I can't. It is just really important that you got this kind of information. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck for tomorrow. And um, I think that, that uh, I can now tell Ruth that I know her name is Ruth. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much.